Next, we'll discuss cardiomyopathies. A cardiomyopathy means that there is a defect in the actual cardiac muscle cell. There are three major types, and the first, which is the most common cardiomyopathy, is dilated cardiomyopathy. There are multiple different etiologies of dilated cardiomyopathy. These patients will develop a very large left ventricular or left ventricular and right ventricular chamber. Generally, these patients develop congestive heart failure. The major causes include alcohol abuse, thiamine deficiency, also known as wet beriberi, some type of viral illness, the most common being the Coxsackie A or B virus, chronic cocaine use, a rare cause is Chagas disease, another common cause is chemotherapy including doxorubicin or some other type of cardiac anthracycline, hemochromatosis, and peripartum cardiomyopathy. These patients will develop systolic dysfunction, meaning a decrease in the ejection fraction. And in contrast with concentric hypertrophy, which occurs during hypertensive heart disease, with dilated cardiomyopathy, these patients will have simply an enlarged chamber with thinning of the left ventricular wall. The major findings in dilated cardiomyopathy include a third heart sound, a dilated heart, specifically the left ventricle, on cardiac echo, and a large balloon-shaped appearance of the left ventricle on the chest x-ray. Dilated cardiomyopathy results in an eccentric hypertrophy, meaning that the sarcomeres are added in series. One of the rarer forms of cardiomyopathy is the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The classic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy involves the interventricular septum. And in patients with symptomatic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the interventricular septum is too close to the mitral valve leaflet, and this leads to outflow tract obstruction, so-called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or HOCM, H-O-C-M. 50% of these cases are familial, autosomal dominant. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is associated with Friedrich's ataxia and is often associated with disoriented, tangled, and hypertrophied myocardial fibers. This is a common cause of sudden death in young athletes. The second most common cause of sudden death in young athletes is anomalous coronary artery takeoff from the aorta. These patients will often develop diastolic dysfunction. And as you're aware, diastolic dysfunction involves defective relaxation of the heart. This is more of a concentric hypertrophy because sarcomeres are added in parallel to each other. The findings of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy include a normal sized heart, but a fourth heart sound, as well as apical impulses and a systolic murmur. These patients should be treated with a beta blocker or a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker for example, verapamil or diltiazem. Because of the hypertrophied interventricular septum, these patients may present with syncope and a systolic murmur. The third type of cardiomyopathy is a restrictive or obliterative cardiomyopathy. In general, we refer to these as infiltrative diseases because they involve some type of external process infiltrating themselves into the cardiac muscle. The major causes include sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, post-radiation fibrosis, and some other type of endocardial fibroelastosis. Other causes include Leffler's syndrome, which is an eosinophilic infiltrate into the endomyocardial fibrosis, and hemochromatosis. Patients with hemochromatosis may also develop a dilated cardiomyopathy. These types of cardiomyopathies usually cause a diastolic dysfunction because the heart has a difficulty relaxing. Congestive heart failure is actually a clinical syndrome and encompasses many different diseases. Patients with congestive heart failure generally have difficulty either with systole or diastole, as well as signs, 
and all of these abnormalities have specific causes within congestive heart failure. Remember that congestive heart failure is not a disease entity in itself, but describes the symptomatology of a patient that may have multiple different disease processes going on. These patients will develop dyspnea on exertion, and that dyspnea is due to the failure of the left ventricular output to increase during exercise. They will also develop cardiac dilatation, and this is because the heart has a very large left ventricular end diastolic volume. The increased left ventricular end diastolic volume is actually a compensatory mechanism that the body uses to try to increase cardiac output. These patients will also develop pulmonary edema and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Pulmonary edema is due to left ventricular failure causing an increased pulmonary venous pressure. That increased pulmonary venous pressure leads to venous distension and transudation of fluid into the airspace. The presence of hemosiderin-laden macrophages, which are also known as heart failure cells in the lung, are due to microhemorrhages from increased pulmonary capillary pressure. Basically, fluid accumulates in the airspace of the lung, and these patients can cough up small amounts of blood, such as pink frothy sputum. Patients will also develop orthopnea, which is shortness of breath when laying flat, and this is because of increased venous return in the supine position, which exacerbates the pulmonary vascular congestion. They may also develop hepatomegaly, from passive congestion of the liver, which is also known as nutmeg-type liver. This is due to increased central venous pressure from right-sided heart failure. This causes an increased resistance to portal flow, and this may also cause liver failure called cardiac cirrhosis. Over time, left ventricular failure causes right ventricular failure, and that right ventricular failure with elevated pulmonary pressures leads to increased systemic venous pressures, which cause lower extremity and sacral edema. This elevated right ventricular pressure also will eventually cause jugular venous distension. To summarize, a decrease in left ventricular contractility from heart failure, be it from myocardial infarction or from some type of cardiomyopathy, leads to a decreased cardiac output as well as pulmonary venous congestion. That pulmonary venous congestion can cause pulmonary edema. Pulmonary venous congestion also leads to decreased right ventricular output, which leads to right heart failure, and that right heart failure causes peripheral edema. Decreased cardiac output also leads to increased sympathetic activity and increased activity of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. That system causes retention of renal sodium and water and leads to increased systemic venous pressures, which lead to increased preload and increased cardiac output initially, but over time can lead to negative remodeling of the left ventricle, including dilatation and hypertrophy. It's important to remember that right heart failure most often results from left heart failure. When the left heart is not able to pump what it receives from the lung, the pressure builds up in the lung, and then the pressure builds up in the right heart. When the pressure is elevated in the right heart, this leads to lower extremity edema and right heart failure. 